Hello, I'm John Rossi, a touring drummer with a love of all things animal. When I'm on the road, I visit as many zoos, aquarium... Hey, wait a minute. What's going on? Hey, what's going on there? Hello? Hello? We interrupt your regularly scheduled program to bring you Rossafari Zoo News. News you can use from the world of zoos and conservation. Every week, we bring you breaking news and analysis from around the globe, featuring the animals you love and the people who care for them. And here's your anchorman, John Rossi. Hello, 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 and welcome back to Rossafari Zoo News, your look at everything going on in the world of zoos, aquariums, conservation, and general animal stuff. Y'all, it has been a very... Very interesting week. So um, I think I, I mentioned this before, but um, Zoe and I are currently fostering a just under four year old Aussie named Otis. He was originally named Odo, and we have changed that to Otis after Otis Redding. And um, he's a great dog. He's he's beautiful, handsome. He really, really wants to be loved, but this dog has been hurt, y'all. I don't know a ton of details. I know that he comes from a hoarding situation, uh, like I think a dog hoarding situation, um, specifically an Aussie hoarding situation. And by that, I don't mean that it was an Australian person hoarding dogs. I mean, you know, they are Australian shepherds, uh, including Otis and, um, it's so crazy to see he's so afraid of everything. There, there's no other way to say it. He is terrified of life. And it's it's honestly heartbreaking to see it. But he wants to be loved so badly. He will occasionally allow himself to come over and get scritches and pets. Uh, he will take food from my hand now. It took a little while. Um... Sometimes I can even pet him while he is is getting uh, food from me. Sometimes he just comes over the other day. Oh, my gosh, like two days ago. He literally came over, put his paws up on the bed while I was asleep, woke me up and like cuddled in for hugs and, and scritches um, with just his little like front paws up on the bed. And it was amazing. And then he ran away and kept running away from me for half the day afterwards. He's just terrified, but he's doing so well. And literally... Every single day, we are seeing progress, which is awesome. But y'all, I got to tell you, I've never done something like this before. I have fostered working dogs and, um, you know, done pet sitting and, and helped people with some, some animals that were maybe not the most uh, well-adjusted. But I've never dealt with what seems to me to be like a dog that had been abused or something because it just the fear is a 10 out of 10 and it breaks my heart every single time that he jukes back a little bit or gets a little bit scared i'm just like no buddy it's cool you're 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 here we're buds we're gonna have the best life uh like short term because i'm definitely not gonna foster fail mm, probably anyway but um and this has just been the whole focus of of my week, really. Um, you know, I'm doing other stuff, but but it's all about making Otis happy and comfy and and hopefully starting the healing process and getting to the point where he will uh, be able to, you know, find his forever home. And that's the goal. And, and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, but right now, every step forward feels amazing. And every step backwards is like a punch in the gut. And I will say, it's not like I don't take it personally. It's not like every step backwards, I'm like, oh, no, why does not notice like me? Bah. I'm not not that narcissistic. I'm, I'm a performer, but I'm still not that narcissistic. Um, but it's just knowing that there's this gorgeous, wonderful dog who has such a big heart, you can tell, and so wants to be loved, who has lived such a life that he's learned to be afraid of everyone and every dog and everything. Uh, that's what breaks my heart every single time. It's just a stark reminder that that people don't treat animals well sometimes. And uh, so that part sucks. But I'm so happy that I'm doing this. And um 
I hope y'all are proud of me because it's it's not easy. But uh, I wanted to share it with y'all. So thanks for listening. Um, yeah, there's some other stuff I could update you on, but we'll we'll talk more next week. I kind of want to get to this. So it is Rasafari Zoo News time. Uh, if you are new to the the show. First of all, thanks for listening to my rant about Otis. Um, but yeah, this is a crowdsourced news show. And so we're going to be talking about the newsy stuff in the world of animals and zoos and stuff. So I'm going to shut up and we're going to get to it. Well, it's one for the pandas, two for the bears, three for the monkeys. Now you should care. Now won't you listen to Zoo News? Oh, you could do anything, but why not listen to Zoo News? All right. So uh, we have been following the crazy story out of the Dallas Zoo for the last couple of weeks. As a quick reminder, a series of incidents happened at the Dallas Zoo, including some Emperor Tamarins being taken and then found and returned healthy. Yay. Vandalism to the fencing of a clouded leopard exhibit that allowed the leopard to get out, although uh, it was, you know, returned safely and everything was okay. And uh, also some vandalism to another monkey exhibit where none of the animals got out and also the death of Pin the Vulture. Now, last week I mentioned that the Dallas Police Department had a suspect in custody, and I am now happy to tell you that it looks like they got the right person because the suspect not only admitted to all of the crimes except for whatever led to the death of Pin, but also said that if released, he would continue to do this because he wants those animals because he loves them so much. Apparently, he took the tamarins in the hope of keeping them, cut open the monkey exhibit in the hopes of getting a monkey, and also cut open the cloudy exhibit in the hopes of getting a clouded leopard. Look, I get it. They're cute. But nope, don't do that. So um, as of now, assuming everything, you know, is real, because you never know what these types of things, uh, but he has admitted to those crimes, again, has not admitted to anything going on with Pin, but, um, and it looks like they have caught the person doing it. So that's a big plus, and we'll be keeping our eyes on it, but hopefully that is the end of the horrors the staff at the Dallas Zoo has been facing. Oh, I actually have two more updates to uh, that story after I recorded that little bit, so I'll just drop those in here. Sometimes I record early and then things happen before I release the episode. Anyway, uh, so the man in question is a 24-year-old named Davian Irwin, and the way that he got caught is um, he actually went and visited Dallas World Aquarium, another incredible facility in, uh, you know, Dallas, Texas there, the same area. And the director of husbandry at the Dallas World Aquarium, Paula Carson, recognized him from the photograph that had been circulated. So um, she called a friend who works at the Dallas Zoo because, of course, this is, you know, the smallest world ever. We, we all know that. And um, yeah, there we go. They went to other staff members and they they took a look. And sure enough, everybody agreed that it was this person. And so they actually um, they kind of did this interesting thing where Paula kept going up and engaging him and talking about the animals there, as well as engaging with other guests to make sure that, um, you know, it didn't seem suspicious. And um, yeah, he asked a bunch of different questions and uh, she answered the questions. And um, as soon as she saw him leave, was able to call the police and uh, help him get caught. We always talk about AZA facilities working well together, but this is a new and kind of ridiculous example of that. And that brings us to a follow up of the Zuziana story, which I mentioned last week. Um, looks like it might have been a copycat type thing where a person stole 12 monkeys, uh, squirrel monkeys in, in particular, uh, from this place called Zuziana in Broussard, Louisiana. Uh, Joseph Randall, 62 years of age, was booked with burglary and 12 counts of cruelty to animal for uh, kidnapping the squirrel monkeys in question. 
While they do have a suspect in custody, none of these squirrel monkeys have been found yet, and uh, it is an open question as to what happened to them and if they're still around and if they are able to be returned or if this is part of a wildlife trafficking thing or what's going on. Is this a copycat thing? I don't know. We will find out. But at least we have a suspect in custody for this crime as well. And we're not done with our Law and Order Ross Safari part yet, uh, sadly, um, because it turns out that uh, there was also vandalism done to an exhibit at the Central Park Zoo uh, that led to an owl escaping. Again, not sure if this is a copycat or a coincidence, but it was the same type of thing that was happening in Dallas. So this was a Eurasian eagle owl that lives at the Central Park Zoo, and it's the exact same story as these other things where uh, somebody apparently came in with wire cutters and cut the wires of the caging, which led the animal to get out and then be thoroughly freaked out. And so it uh, it flew away. Of course it did. And there were a couple of near incidents where they they thought they were able to to catch it again. As a matter of fact, um, the police department tweeted that they had captured it, but they did not. They just got close and then it got scared of the uh the people gathering around to watch and and flew off so yet another act of vandalism at an incredible zoo it's it's just heartbreaking as of the time of this recording the owl which is named flacco uh is still in central park and has been hanging out in central park's hallett wildlife sanctuary but no onlookers have seen it eat at all and there are concerns that it's not truly taking care of itself so hopefully this can come to a peaceful resolution soon and in what is being called a coincidence and unrelated and not a possible criminal activity, but also a hell of a coincidence, I suppose, uh, a 300-pound Andean bear named Ben was found outside his habitat on Tuesday morning at the St. Louis Zoo. This happened before the zoo was open, and staff was able to get the bear tranquilized, checked out by vets, given a clean bill of health, and put back on exhibit. Uh, it sounds like the bear was messing with the steel mesh enclosure and caused one of the steel cables to break, creating a hole which it was then able to exploit and go wander the zoo. So now the uh, zoo is examining that and all of their other enclosures to make sure that something like this doesn't happen again. Uh, I assume that the St. Louis Zoo is being truthful here. They they said that this was not an act of vandalism, and, and I know there are lots of cameras and stuff. Um, but man, it was really scary reading that after the incidents at Dallas and Zooziana and um, Central Park Zoo. So uh, yeah, hopefully we can stop reporting on stuff like this soon. That would be lovely. Okay, so this next story hurts my soul, but in a different, much funnier way. Um, so ever since I started this podcast, I have made it a point to report on the uh, best zoos lists that get put up by various uh, websites. And the one that cracks me up the most and that I've talked about on here the most is that every year, USA Today does three that are related to zoo news. They do Best Zoo in America, Best Aquarium in America, and the Best Zoo Exhibit in America. And these are all top ten lists. They get nominated by experts, and then it's just up to fan voting. And you may remember that last year I had a little bit of fun laughing about the fact that um, the Cincinnati Zoo member page has some people that are really dedicated to winning this contest every year. And so they always post daily and convince people to vote. And so, like, they're always going to win. And that's cool. Whatever. Cincy is a wonderful zoo. Y'all know that. I love it there. But, you know, fan voting is nothing more than who can mobilize their fans to vote. And most zoos simply make make no effort. Uh, San Diego barely cracks the top 10 every year simply because they don't ask people to vote for them. And so, yeah, nobody does. Well, it, it turns out that this year is going a little differently than previous years. I don't know what it is, but uh, zoos and aquariums have absolutely jumped into this competition with vigor. 
I have seen posts from Cincinnati, from uh, Henry Dorley, from Adventure Aquarium, daily asking people to go and vote for them in this competition. It's it's still silliness. It's still just whoever can garner the most votes. But um, suddenly people at uh, all of these facilities are like passionate about this contest. As a matter of fact, I remember that last year when I was following uh, when the one person in particular was trying to get Cincy members to vote so that it would win, uh, it it was always first. I mean, I think every once in a blue moon it would drop out to like second for like an hour and then go back up to first. But like, you know, when one person is concentrated on this effort, of course it's going to work. This year they haven't gotten past fourth yet because so many other places are asking for these votes. Now, who knows what will happen at the end, but it's really crazy to watch all of these places suddenly uh, caring about this thing that I've kind of made fun of for the last couple of years. So I will be sure to report on the results and uh, still still mock them because it's, it's just fan voting. But um, it's definitely interesting to see all of these different facilities dive in and, and take this a little more seriously. Okay, so I'm about to be wildly hypocritical here. I know that I was kind of just making fun of a votey thing, but um, look, you know, I think things like USA Today are just trading in on the popularity of zoos and aquariums to get clicks, and, and that's not my favorite thing. However, uh, I do want to tell you about another competition that's going on that kind of is my favorite thing. Our amazing friends at Penguins International are doing March of the Penguin Madness 2023. Each year, they come up with a different type of bracket to do about penguins, and they've been really fun and really cool. For 2023, it is about individual penguins from zoos and aquariums worldwide. So you can go to Penguins International's pages on Facebook or on Instagram, and if you are an aquarium or zoo professional, you can submit one of your penguins by going to uh, their their link there. And then um, if you're a follower who has a penguin at your facility that you love, you know, if you're a zoo fan or aquarium fan like me, then uh, you can go to Penguins International Facebook or Instagram pages and tag that facility and get them to nominate one of their penguins or maybe the penguin that you love so much. Uh, so this is going on right now, and then um, by the end of February, Penguins International is going to reach out to all of these different organizations, and then in March, uh, there will be a voting thing, a March Madness-style thing, March of the Penguin Madness, and I just think this is so creative and so unique and so good, and Penguins International is an AZA uh, partner and a conservation organization, and um, we all need to support this, and I already know what penguin I want to win and I don't even know if it's been nominated yet but I'm 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 pushing I'm doing things behind the scenes to try and make it happen because I just love this so freaking much so go support penguins international and get ready to vote for your favorite penguin in march all right so um now I'm going to spend some time talking about some animals that uh, have passed away at zoos and um you may notice that uh, if you've been listening to zoo news for a while I tend to be doing more of these now. And uh, originally my attitude was that basically I wasn't going to announce births or deaths unless they were super meaningful, super famous animals, you know, something like that. There was a reason to. But I've had a lot of keepers and even just like zoo fanatics reach out and tell me that it means a lot to them to hear um, the animals that they loved memorialized on Zoo News. So I've been trying to balance it and not just, you know, announce every death, but open that up a little bit more. And one of the things that I wanted to do here was to share with y'all what these losses feel like to the people that love them. So when former guest and great friend of the pod, Sam Evans of the Honolulu Zoo, reached out to let me know that a, a very important animal to her passed away at the zoo, I asked her if she'd be willing to record something about it to, to share a little bit about that with y'all. Uh, so here is Sam. Hi, I'm Sam. I'm a zookeeper at the Honolulu Zoo. Recently, we lost our nine-year-old male bongo, Corey. Male bongos typically only live to be about nine in the wild, 
That being said, it was not an expected loss, though no loss really ever is. He really touched his keepers that he worked with, uh, especially me. I never thought I'd fall in love with a bongo. But he was incredibly smart, incredibly sweet. And he was always begging and always wanting attention and scratches. Um, He left behind two other female bongos, Topanga and Riley. Riley was his daughter that he had with Topanga. Um, They took it hard, too. Um, we saw them constantly spending time where they last saw him and not really wanting to leave. It took them a little while. They're doing better now. I'm doing better now, but these losses are always hard. And even when they're expected, they're not easy. We don't have full answers yet. The knee is still, um, waiting for answers, but we all really really miss him and hope we get the answers that we're looking for thanks john for letting me talk about him for a second it definitely helps to talk about him i still catch myself calling for him in the morning so um really appreciate it thanks guys no thank thank you sam that was very cool of you to share that um and you know normally i will edit audio and and clean things up a little bit but i just i just think you can hear those pauses and you can hear the emotion in what sam says so i just let it ride as is um you know it's it's hard when these things happen and i think it's important for us to to remember that um, now, moving on and talking about some other losses uh, in the the last couple of weeks at zoos, the biggest one and and one that I'm going to talk about a little bit here is Lele, the giant panda at the Memphis Zoo. Now, this is a bear who was geriatric, um, although, you know, had not yet reached uh, the age that you would hope they would in captivity uh, before passing, and actually was supposed to be going back to China later this year. Um, I have a lot of thoughts about this. First of all, um, you know, my condolences go out to everyone at Memphis. It's an incredible facility. Their panda care team is amazing, and uh, I'm sure this is devastating. You may remember from previous Zoo News episodes that there had been a lot of controversy about the bears at Memphis. There were people, just, you know, internet warriors and PETA people, and um, even celebrities got involved um, saying that these bears were mistreated and that they were unhealthy and that they were going to die. And um, a team of vets from China came over and checked them out and were like, nope, all is well. And obviously, you know, the Memphis Zoo is a great zoo and they were taking good care of them and they said all is well. Um, So my guess is, and it's only a guess because they do not have necropsy results yet, but my guess is that this is just an elderly bear passing. It happens, you know, they will probably find that there was some undiagnosed disease that couldn't be recognized and um you know that again this is my guess but that's what i'm guessing happened but of course all of those people who uh you know made a big deal about this are now saying that this proves that they were right and that they're mistreating the bears and that yaya needs to get out of there right away and blah 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 and the memphis zoo is evil and all that stuff and it's just not true it is just not true uh, we don't know what happened, but this one this one hurts. This one hurts not just from a, a an animal perspective and a care perspective, um, but but because of the controversy around these two bears, losing one of them is problematic. Uh, just from a pure PR standpoint, honestly. And I mean, obviously, I hate to think about animals in that way, but in this case, it happens to be true. So sending condolences to uh, everyone at the Memphis Zoo, and uh, hopefully there's not a ton of fallout from from what I'm hoping will be found to just be a, a natural death. And, uh, you know, hopefully there will be transparency with the necropsy results, and, and we will uh, we will find out. Spock, a 14-year-old Kirk's Dick Dick, was humanely euthanized at the Denver Zoo after they found out that he had metastatic cancer and end-stage liver failure. 
Spock was one of the oldest Kirk's dick dicks in zoos accredited by the AZA and uh, was a good four years past the life expectancy for his species. He will be missed. We also send our condolences to the Trevor Zoo at Millbrook on the passing of Shy, a 15-year-old female red wolf that lived at the zoo. Now, I have spent a good bit of time at that zoo and have spent way too much of that time staring at Shy because despite the name, Shy was not a particularly bashful red wolf and was an absolute beautiful, beautiful animal. Um, Before going to the Trevor Zoo, she actually was very, very famous at the Mill Mountain Zoo in Roanoke, Virginia, and also uh, at the Beardsley Zoo in Bridgeport, Connecticut, two other zoos that uh, we have a great relationship with. Um, Shy lived with another red wolf named Clifford, and uh, they have been best friends ever since they were first introduced to each other. So this is a very sad loss for the Trevor Zoo, but it's amazing that not only did Shy get to make you know, thousands, if not millions of, of people uh, learn about the plight of her species, but um, also got to spend some time with some uh, high school kids at the end, you know, teaching them how to be keepers and, and work with such an amazing species. Goodbye, sweet girl. Good friend of the pod, Ren Howell, also reached out to let me know that Frankie the Numbat at Wildlife Sydney Zoo passed away. Frankie was seven years old, which is uh, very close to double the life expectancy of a numbat. And um, despite being a very small animal, was known for having a huge personality. Uh, Guests and keepers absolutely adored Frankie. So uh, it's just sad to say goodbye, even though, you know, he lived a great long life for a numbat. Billy the Giraffe recently passed away at the Virginia Zoo. Billy was 18 feet tall and over 21 years old, um, making him one of the oldest in human care. So this was just another age-related passing, but one that still really matters and is really, really hard for, for the keepers. I can't even imagine loving an animal that long and then having to say goodbye. So uh, condolences to, to the entire staff at the Virginia Zoo, as well as all of the fans of Billy the Giraffe. So those are just some of the losses that I wanted to share about. And uh, if you're a keeper and you want to hop on here and share about an animal that was important to you, just just let me know and we'll make that happen. All right. Getting away from the sad stories of animals does not entirely mean getting away from sad stories, though. Uh, There's one story that I need to share with you all, and I'm going to include a link to this in the show notes. So please go and check that out. Zoo Montana announced that one of their keeper staff and her husband lost their newly purchased home to a fire this week. Not only did they lose all of their possessions, but three of their beloved dogs and one cat as well. Uh, They have set up a GoFundMe to help Amanda, the the keeper in question, and her husband, and um, are promoting it on the Zoo Montana page. So I will include a link where you can just go to at Zoo Montana on their socials and help out if you can. Okay, so let's do a 180 and get back to the laughs, right? Because that stuff's important, but, you know, so is having some fun. Uh, So the um, zookeeping staff at... Kujukushima Zoo in Japan two years ago found themselves with a bit of a mystery. A female white-handed gibbon named Momo got pregnant despite the fact that she lives alone. Parthenogenesis in white-handed gibbons? Question mark? Well, no. The answer is definitely no, and the zoo has finally been able to figure out what happened. So it's taken two years because the mother was super protective of the baby, and so they weren't able to do any DNA testing for a long time. But finally, they were able to get a DNA sample from the baby and figure out who the father was. And it turns out that the father lived in the enclosure next door to Momo. So um, apparently what was happening was that there was a small little hole in the wood between their two exhibits that they were able to use to copulate through. So it was a, um, I guess you would say it was a giving glory hole. And uh, yeah, and that's how this baby happened. So it wasn't parthenogenesis. It was um, 
a hole in the wood. Uh, to, to quote one of my favorite movies, life finds a way. And unlike Momo the Gibbon, who is very much not frigid, uh, the temperatures in the Northeast absolutely have been recently, causing more and more zoos to close for a day or even a couple of days to keep their animals warm and safe. Now, I've been a fan of zoos a long time, and I certainly don't have any record of this, but it seems to me that zoos are more willing to close now than they used to be for things like cold days and for um, needed construction and and stuff like that. It just seems to be a trend that I'm noticing. And I think that maybe what happened is that uh, COVID taught them that, you know, they can do with a little less time open to the public from time to time they they got through okay uh it was a struggle so like no zoos want to close for an extended period of time but uh i'm guessing that's what happened because like i said i've just i've noticed this trend and i think it's a good thing i think it's um good for animal care and it means that the staff can get in quicker and do their jobs more efficiently and get out and stay safe so i'm all for it even though i do get sad when i can't go to the zoo but um yeah i I think it's a good trend to see And uh, yeah, it's been happening in the Northeast uh, a bunch recently. Our friends at Adventure Aquarium are currently celebrating hashtag we see you like S.E.A. Get it Uh, now through February 20th. If you visit Adventure Aquarium, uh, you will have the chance to be surprised and delighted with, quote, fantastic giveaways like animal encounters, gift cards, hippo kisses. You don't get to hit like actually kiss a hippo but um you know like they their artwork it's hippo kiss artwork and other surprises worth shell abrading i love adventure aquarium and i love that they're always looking for great new ways to connect with their audience And last but not least in zoo news, um, the Utica Zoo is having a vote for Prezudent competition. Um, So basically, uh, on February 18th to the 20th, you can go to the Utica Zoo and you can vote for uh, one of the animals there to become the Prezudent of the zoo. Uh, However, if you would like, you can help your favorite candidate get a head start with a donation to their campaign now. For every $10 donated to your candidate's campaign, they will receive an extra five votes, which you can uh, go check out at uticazoo.org slash prezudent. And uh, the main reason I'm mentioning this, other than because, you know, it's a cool little fundraiser for the zoo to do, but that our good friend May Lin, also known uh, as Mimi, who was born at the Cincinnati Zoo and has starred on the Rasafari podcast, is up for president of the zoo and is currently winning. So uh, there you have it, folks. You can go and vote for Mimi for her first political office. I guarantee you there will be no scandals and a whole lot of cuteness. Conservation! Conservation! News time! Oh yeah! A new study has revealed the fact that long-lasting chemicals are often found in endangered southern resident killer whales. The study is really complicated and goes into lots of crazy chemical names but basically uh the problem is that there's just a whole lot of toxic stuff that's making its way into the oceans into smaller animals and then up the food chain to killer whales uh there is a type of pollutant known as 4-nonylphenol also known as 4NP and this is a compound that is listed as a toxic substance and is known to interact with the nervous system An impact cognitive function, 4NP accounted for 46% of the total pollutants identified in killer whales in this study. Basically, what that means is it can really mess with the thinking process of these killer whales, and that might explain why we're seeing more boat strikes and whales washing up on shore unexpectedly and stuff like that. So this is a real big problem. It also turns out that 95% of 4NPs transfer from mothers to fetuses during pregnancy. So these uh, pollutants are not just 
just going up the food chain, but they're a generational problem. So we need a lot more protections about what is going into our oceans to save species like killer whales. And that's not all we got on killer whales this week, friends. And uh, this next story is really interesting. So a study done recently has shown that killer whale moms support their adult sons for basically their whole lives. That's just uh, that's crazy to me. But yeah, so um, these mothers will literally keep their sons with them, you know, into their 20s even, and will go diving down and like, let's say they find a salmon. They will grab it in their mouth, take it up to the surface where their son is, bite it in half, and each of them will eat half of the salmon. The mother basically never stops taking care of her son. In a lot of cases, when a mother passes away, within two or three years, the son will die as well, possibly due to lack of nutrition or because it just never really learned how to whale properly. Um, but this is an absolutely fascinating study. And the scientists believe the reason why is that when the males do become adults and are raised by their mothers, they are some of the biggest and strongest ones out there and thus are more likely to reproduce themselves. So the mom's genes get to carry on through the son. Uh, repeatedly. However, one thing that makes it interesting is that mothers can reproduce regularly if they want to, but normally once they start taking care of their son, they stop reproducing. They don't have the ability to meet other males because they're too busy taking care of their 20-year-old son. I feel like there are a lot of millennial or even Gen Z jokes in here now, but they would all be inaccurate, just, just saying. But so, yeah, the scientists think that it's an investment into future generations because they only do this with their sons. But if their sons get to be big, strong whales, then they get to mate a lot. So um, it, it's, I believe, the only example of a female uh, of a species taking care of its son that late in life when it is a species that could continue to breed if it didn't choose that path. So really fascinating finding. So last year, we talked about the fact that a Stellar's sea eagle uh, decided to spend some time in Maine, despite the fact that they are native to Eastern Asia. And it was there for a couple months and then left. And um, we've talked about a couple other examples of birds just showing up in places that they really shouldn't. Well, the Stellar's sea eagle has now returned to Maine. Um, which is the first time that we've ever seen something like that happen with one of these misplaced birds. So we don't really know what's going on. We don't really understand it. But um, it seems like uh, it is an area where the, um, the birds that are native to the area thrive and uh, there's a ton of food there and everything. But yeah, it, it looks like um, it, it looks like the stellar sea eagle is back in Maine for the second time. An interesting mystery, interesting opportunity for you birders out there to go see a stellar sea eagle in Maine. And uh, yeah, we'll be curious to see, uh, is it going to start its own satellite colony or is this just a fluke or what's going on? Hopefully science can figure it out. The English government recently announced a plan to expand wildlife habitats and create 25 new or enlarged national nature reserves. The goal is that everyone in England will live within a 15 minutes walk of a green space or water within the next five years. The English government is dedicated to making sure that its citizenry gets some time out in nature no matter where they are, and I think that's absolutely fantastic. And even though the government is looking at it from a helping citizens standpoint, obviously protecting more land and creating more natural spaces is only going to help the animals in the country as well, which I just think is amazing. And last but not least in conservation news this week, the Biden administration took a first step towards ending federal protections for grizzly bears in the northern Rocky Mountains, which would open the door to grizzly hunting in Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho. 
The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service said that officials from all of those states have provided a lot of evidence showing that grizzlies have recovered from the threat of extinction in the regions surrounding Yellowstone National Park and Glacier National Park. Of course, as this is happening, other areas uh, are also proposing laws that would allow grizzly hunting in areas where the population hasn't expanded and is still considered endangered. So this is this kind of weird back and forth where like, great, the population recovered, but if we hunt them, maybe they'll unrecover. And also this then opens up hunting in other areas and risks of uh, grizzlies in other areas getting killed and the overall population dropping and yeah i'm not super happy about this but uh we'll keep an eye on it and and see what happens it's time for other news it's time for other news hey now right now then now it's time it's time for other news hey it's a segue to the park on A photographer named Sasha Fonseca has captured an image of a snow leopard in Leh, Ladakh, India, which is high in the Indian Himalayas. Uh, This was part of a three-year bait-free camera trap project, and it is one of the most gorgeous photos I have ever seen. I highly recommend that you look this up, and the easiest way to do that is by Googling Wildlife Photographer of the Year People's Choice Award, because uh, Sasha Fonseca won that award for this picture world of the snow leopard uh it's absolutely gorgeous it captures the front half of a snow leopard including the most beautiful blue eyes that you maybe have ever seen uh and a sunset in the uh himalayas so it's it's really gorgeous and i I highly recommend that you check it out So last week, I told you about a pink pigeon that was found in New York City, and it was believed that the pigeon had been dyed pink as part of a gender reveal party. Gross. Well, uh, people went ahead and named the pigeon Flamingo, and then it died. Uh, And the rescuers believe that the death was a reaction to the hair dye, which was used to dye the bird pink. So, um, hey... Stop it with the gender reveal parties, just in general, in my opinion. Now you got you do you, you do you. I'm just being snarky. But um, all joking aside, though, you know, this is the kind of thing that just drives me up the wall. Why would you die a pigeon? Pink. And not even consider what it could do to the bird. So this just makes me sad. But the the pink pigeon flamingo is now gone. Now, last week, I told you that you could do a couple of fun things for uh, Valentine's Day, including certain things like naming a roach at uh, the Bronx Zoo for someone you love, or being a little snarky and naming bugs like crickets and such and mealworms uh, after an X, which would then be fed to an animal. There are a bunch of zoos doing this, and uh, I think it's a pretty fun way to raise some money. Well, it turns out that the Animal Friends Humane Society in Hamilton, Ohio, is accepting a $5 donation to write your ex's name in a litter box and allow their cats to uh, use said litter box. So uh, if that's something you want to do, go give five bucks to this Humane Society and uh, get a good laugh. Animal, animal, animal holidays. Animal, animal, animal holidays. All right, so it remains February, so it is still Adopt a Rescue Rabbit Month, International Hoof Care Month, Fishing Cat February, and National Bird Feeding Month. And then for your individual days, on the 12th, which is Super Bowl Sunday, it's also Superb Owl Day. The 13th is Love Hornbills Day, and I do, I really love hornbills. The 14th is World Bonobo Day, and the 15th is National Hippo Day. So maybe you should go to Adventure Aquarium, hang out with Button and Jenny for their day, and also maybe get to win some cool stuff because of the whole we see you thing. Just saying. And those are your animal holidays for the week.
All right. So since I was talking about my boy Otis at the beginning, I did forget to say this, but um, if you hear any stories or see any stories that you would like to share uh, with me that might make it into the episode, uh, you can do so by tagging me in them at Ross Safari or DMing them to me. Uh, that's on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. It's also at Ross Safari Pod on TikTok. And then I'll say your name at the end of the episode like this. I'd like to say thank you to everybody who contributed to this week's episode. Anya Keen, Colleen Lenahan, Kim Cooley, Carrie Kirkpatrick, Kevin Williams, Kristen Khalil, Ali Malinsky, Ren Howell, Jacob Newman, Zen Fay, Dylan Hoy, Liz Dunlevy, and of course, Sam Evans for not only reaching out, but sending in that incredible audio. Thank you so much. Also, if you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash Safari. I'd like to say thank you to my Red Panda level patrons, Lara Shank and Kristen Dickey. Don't forget to go to the show notes and check out the link to the Zoo Miami Keeper that needs your help right now. Please give a little bit if you can. And remember, friends, the words newsy credits backwards are Steiderk Yeswen. The Ross Safari Podcast is produced, hosted, and engineered by John Rossi. Editing and fact-checking by John and Dr. Zoe Rossi. Our theme song is Sevens by Nathan Burke, performed by Nathan and John. Interrupting John theme and additional voices by Taylor Isaac Gray. You can reach John directly on Instagram and Facebook at Ross Safari or by email at rossafaripod at gmail.com. Ross Safari is part of the Daydreamer Media Network. Now, stop listening to me and go visit a zoo.